All right. And uh, do we have a quorum? I don't think we have. I don't have anything particularly to dive into today. You know, I, mean, I open the floor. Anybody want to have something that they want to share? Anything burning regarding the world of tech, music, and blockchain? Well, I can say that we uh, we had some good sessions. We, uh, the, the Crown went out to Bear Creek Studio. I took a couple of days off before uh, going to do um, fundraising and stuff for Archie. And uh, the, we went out to Bear Creek Studio, had a, a two and a half days of good sessions. Tony Duvall was the producer on those sessions. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we had a really good time. We knocked out uh, recordings of um, 10 songs. Congratulations, that's great. And, um, yeah, no, it was a good, uh, it's a good experience. I think everyone enjoyed themselves and the music. I got a really nice note from uh, Tony, the producer, and I told him, you know, I think you're really going to like this music. And he he wrote back um, just the other day, you were right. This is really good. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, so, uh, I, I was pleased to, pleased to hear that, yeah. So, um, don't know when the, uh, when the album will be out, but it'll, it'll be out, uh, you know, hopefully before the end of this year. I certainly hope so, because we have a tech that you and your entire um, ensemble need to uh, move through for the release of that album. But of course, they could all do the same work with the previously released record. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. You know, I'll, I'll say one thing that's um, been popping up for me as we've been building out our song and, and, you know, particularly in this first phase, the instance of registering music, registering um, identity, um, associating identity with a wallet and, you know, and the whole concept around how artists can get paid in the very near future. And what does that look like over the next um, five to 10 years? in regards to um, will this be something that is mass adopted and who in the space will be able to get to a place where um, they have the deep, deep database of, of millions of songs um, that are associated with smart contracts and this distribution system that would then be able to move that catalog um, from one um, blockchain platform or blockchain music streaming platform to another, you know, I mean, hypothetically think, speaking, what happens when um, a, the, the next Sticky Baby or Distro Kid <coughs> creates the, here's the catalog, here are the smart contracts, everything works, and then is able to move that catalog or, or distribute that catalog to other platforms. So I've been thinking about that, considering everything that we're building, and it'll be interesting to see who in the um, next few years is going to have that depth of catalog and who will be able to monetize that catalog um, by um, licensing it or expanding it over to other platforms. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I imagine, you know, artists will want to be able to... Um, distribute their work on lots of different platforms. I Absolutely. Don't why, I don't yeah. know why they would feel like they need to be, you know, tied up with one platform. No, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, in the same manner of how CD Baby, In Grooves, DistroKid, and, you know, the other guys that are acquiring content and then distributing it all over the world, I think something similarly will play out in the coming years specific to our industry. You know, and when you know, we... When we so, so it'll be it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out, because I've been th as I as I recognize um, the kernel of a work that we have completed for our song. This little nugget, um, I could see what that little nugget represents um, in the long term. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's, uh, you know, that's the the nice thing about um, uh, that's the way I feel about doing good work in general is. If you if you do good work, then you get a glimpse of the next work. Kind of the, the reward for good work is more work. 
<laughs> that is that is the truth. <laughs> yep. Agreed. Agreed. I see Mr. Jensen has joined us. Good morning, Rich. Hi guys. How's it going, ma'am? It's good. I was just reflecting on on what you're saying and and uh where it went for me was um you know, it's, I think it's the case, I, I, I haven't, to be honest, you know, in my career, I haven't spent a lot of time, at different times I've intersected with emerging technologies. Um, you know, the web was one, I kind of, I was, I had, I had some clues to the World Wide Web coming on uh, a little, a little before it happened. My first experience on World Wide Web was so, through something called uh, Lynx, that was before there, gra it was a graphical interface, it was just, um, um, URL tabs, essentially. Um, it was all text based and so on. And um, what, uh, what, 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 that, what that does for me is, you know, or where my reflections went in, in listening to your comment, comments was that, um, you know, as these emergent forms come up, they're interesting to the participants that are building the forms. You know, who, which form is this going to, how is this going to manifest? Um, but then one, then it becomes very uninteresting. Once it, like there's a, there's a process by which it just becomes like water that you drink in a glass. Like if you've never heard of water, you've never heard of a glass, you could have a really fascinating conversation about a container that mm -hmm. like, there's a container that, that will hold a liquid and, and allow you to like, and different people could debate it. But then two years later we're in a society that now has lots of glasses, we don't even think of who's delivering the service, who's delivering the utility. Absolutely. I think and we uh, go back to the thirst. Mm -hmm. The thirst is what drives the solution. So, um, you know, and I guess so, you know, and this isn't a critical comment at all. It's just kind of where my reflections went is you were talking about like, which, where do the catalogs go? And I think Greg's comment about um, artists, not being one to be tied down to one library or another. Mm -hmm. um, what really will matter is I think I think what we're what's emerging and where actually a project like our song has a great uh, opportunity to make its case is in the um, in the manner in which you know what are the values that are attached to like artist data like and so this is why. You know, as as there's such political reaction right now to um, to the platforms, you know, Elizabeth Warren is out there saying we should bust up Google and Facebook and Amazon. You know, um, and so what I guess what I'm saying is is that you know, just like we don't care who's manufacturing our pencils or pens or any of these ordinary objects, the artist of the future, the very near future, won't really care about these things that concern us. So to, terrifically, they'll consent. They'll be concerned with how am I being treated? Is my privacy respected? Do and I, I mean, own? Is my I mean, relationship with my artists um, appropriate to my vision? Um, and and so anyway, yeah. Please, I, I don't mean to go and on. How I'm getting paid and how I'm getting paid. Oh sure. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, you know, cause well, we're gonna get paid through UBI, man. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I think um, you know, in the in the background, you know. But music fans don't know anything about The Orchard or CD Baby or any of the distributors. They just know that the music is available on Spotify and iTunes and all the various platforms. You know, no one ever knows about the distributor. No one ever knows about, oh, you've got Red Distribution or Caroline is distributing your records over to Virgin. No, nobody knows that back in the day. And I think in the present day, one of the um, verticals, I would say for our song, you know, there's obviously streaming and social media and all these other things that are attached to it. But, uh, you know, as I think about future, you know, the next level distribution models built on blockchain technology and where that's going to go, because eventually everyone that's got the music, if this all becomes mass adopted, which, you know, I think all of us on this call believe that it will be, there will be a point of mass adoption for the way that music and assets move around the world online in the next version of the internet using blockchain technology. And when that moment takes place, the millions upon millions of songs that are out there are all going to be landing on some blockchain solution to allow for automated financial distributions. And um, yeah, and I think we've, I think we've got the beginnings of a really good engine to, to, to carry that. 
So I'm excited. I'm excited about it because as 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 Ned and I have just been getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the weeds of, of the work. Um, you know, I'm just I'm starting to see the glimmers around the the possibilities beyond the things that we were thinking of before. Well, and I'll just say, I mean, because I think I think music's like water. You know, I think it's just uh, it's a it's it's this organic uh, ubiquitous thing. Mm -hmm. And and one of the one of the things that's different about the old distribution model, you mentioned things like Caroline, et cetera, is that now if if you're an asshole, if you're if you're or even if you're just wrong about the basic sort of context of relations, uh, social relations mm -hmm. around music, you know, if you're contributing, you know, there are certain people, certain people don't care. But there, you know, there are plenty of very interesting artists that are very suspicious about uh, digital digitization at all. There's a whole industry based on analog fetish because, yep. you know, and, and there, there, there are a lot of people dropping out of Facebook because they think that the basic social proposition of, yeah, I get to talk to my mom, but why is, you know, why is Mark Zuckerberg watching and who's he hired and, and wh what's Cambridge Analytica, all of these things. Like when it gets too far away, people, so what I'm saying is that um, um, what really matters and this, you know, this has been my, this has been my, my general position and, and, and again, I'm not here to be critical. I'm just, I'm just sharing my position and how, mm -hmm. it, how it operates is, you know, so in a world where you have some really interesting artists, like skeptical about any kind of transmission, trust is the thing. Trust. Mm -hmm. Trust is the thing, and then also beyond trust, being able to make those arguments uh, that support trust. You know, like and and so um, you know, I kind of I'm really I'm really looking forward to. I mean, yes, we're going to have tech, technical infrastructure that orders the world in fascinating ways in the very near future, and uh, our chain and um, the our song project. You know, the, I'm here because I think there's a really valuable role for these um, group, you know, really what's a group of people um, um, working with this technology. I think there's a valuable role for, for the kind of social ethic that is on display uh, in this um, context um, that will both create the technology but also inform and be contained by. It will be the water. The music will be the water that will go in the in the cups, um, uh, and so so. But the, but but being um, paying attention to what is primary in the social transaction in the social context, I think is is absolutely vital. You know, yep. and again, not 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 being critical of of any approach, just 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 being Rich Jensen about it. Yep, dig it. Well, once this thing is built out, we'll start seeing how it um, engages in the world of social and the, the heart and spirit that is put on it. Um, right now, we're just getting the bones in place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, and uh, that's my other, my other kind of proposition is that the ideal uh, sort of research environment or, or social context for research is one where, you know, the, um, there's, a, there's a rich field of resources and lots of projects and teams and yeah. and um and I, I think that the you know i think that the basic r song proposition uh is reasonable and i'm i've been excited to find that uh you guys are engaging uh fruitful conversations with different organizations mm -hmm. but i also like i'm also just as a person um you know there are all kinds of projects that cut that are passing by and I, you know, uh, I, I'm always looking for a proper context where, you know, what I'm saying is I think there is, I think there are opportunities with really interesting artists who understand the process of bringing uh, a, a technical platforms into the world. And, you know, we've lived through the uh, webs 1.0 and 2.0. Um, so, you know, there are some very sophisticated people out there or people who are willing to to work with things that are small. That's my thing. I, I, mm -hmm. I like the I like the idea because if you can actually get a flame burning, it doesn't matter what size it is. You know, as long as you've got a little, it's so much easier once you've got that fire burning 
It doesn't take very much because then you can add material. But the difference between having the idea about what fire is and you're in the woods uh, with no matches and beating on rocks all day to try to get something versus having that little flame, like it's, it's a quantum, quantum state. Um, so anyway, so I, 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 I will hope, I'm, I'm always looking forward to different opportunities. I'm hoping to see um, the platform be open to, to small scale approaches, um, not just, um, you know, ones that are rushing to, to have, um, um, you know, have, be, be based on a, a principle of, 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 of rapid growth, you know, which I, under, I understand that, but also uh, it's getting the principles right, get the vibe right, mm -hmm. um, you know, because just two or three people getting the vibe right in a room, uh, docu well documented, um, can change the world, as we know. That's why we do music. It's so true. Well, it's so true. Agreed. You know, one of the things I've thought about a lot, you know, your, your music is water analogy makes me feel like, you know, part of the part of the problem for a lot of art, musicians and artists is exactly this you know, music is water perception. Mm. Hey, right? hey, Greg, I'm having trouble hearing you. Is that better? Can oh, yeah, now? much better. Thank you. OK. <laughs> yeah, uh, so so, yeah, the, the, the music is water um, perception is is one that makes it very difficult for musicians to get paid for their labor. Um, I don't. Yeah, I disagree. I mean, I, I, I think I've worked in the DIY environment my whole life. So, um, and it's, it's at different times it's paid off. I think a lot of people, correct. I don't, I don't think a lot of people understand like, you know, for a three minute, three and a half minute song, how much work goes into that, except musicians and producers and, and studio engineers, right? It's, it's a, it's it's a lot of work you know it's like you know it's you know there's there's this spark of creativity that might happen you know like if you're if you're really really lucky you can get a song whole cloth right all at once but e even songs just the, the composition of a song might take a very long time but after oh, that course. you know after a, even after the spark of creativity just bringing it to life in terms of a proper arrangement and being able to play it fluidly and all of that that's that's weeks if not months uh, i know for for the crown's first album natasha and i worked on that for two years before we we brought it out into the world um and that's you know that's just like 10 songs two years worth of work um and uh, you know and then and then there's like the hours and hours of labor in the studio and in the mixing so so there's tons and tons of attention and labor that goes into getting a song out to the point where someone can hear it. But there's, you know, the music is water feeling as well. Yeah, okay, it's just, it's as abundant as water, it's as free as water is, you know? And so there's the, the musician, the perception is that n no one understands the work that went into that, so it's not valued. And I've thought a lot about the, the kind of Lysistrata strategy, right? Like what if, what if um, musicians played the, the Lysistrata card and said, look, we're just not going to play for the next 10 years. You know what would right? happen is people would. People and, would uh, okay. uh, but. Uh, oh. Greg, you got you you you. you and I don't think out. anyone would note it. There's so much music out. Yeah, I just I just don't think anyone music out there. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're back. Okay, all right, sweet. So I was just, I was just saying that, uh, but but I was I was wondering if we might be able to change that with a a different feature set with with respect to, um, uh, you know, songs. Like, what if, what if you you could swap songs so you so you you had the right to listen to a song but you could give it up you know sort of so more like a you know those little library things that have popped up, popped up all around seattle where there's these little pockets of books and people come and they grab a book and they put a book in um what if you could what if you could do that with songs on the platform so you know maybe you've listened to uh 
Ariana Grande's, uh, you know, your favorite Ariana Grande song enough that you feel like if you listen to it again, it's not going to be exciting. Um, but you, you'd like to hear something else. So you swap it for something else. Hmm. Um, just, I mean, just I'm, I'm trying to think of ways in which scarcity and uh, uh, letting go of things uh, can play a role in the regeneration of interest and appreciation for the artist. Does any of that make sense? Well, I, I think I understand. I, it's a field of inquiry that you're opening by, by saying a proposition. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, I, I feel like pushing back on, on the um, conclusion that you draw from the water is music analogy. Um, uh, because um, there's, I mean, because I guess, I guess where I would go is uh, we have to draw, you know, there's this thing called capitalism, which, which is a game that drives value um, within itself, within its own context. Um, and there's a, um, you know, that is a, um, it's a formal context at remove from, uh, you know, from the uncommoditized world. And so, you know, the fact of ma water's relative ubiquity, um, it doesn't make it less precious, you know, um, because, and what I was trying to say in my, in my, my, you know, I think I, what I was trying to say is there's, or, music is organic. I think, you know, I, I personally, in my reflections on art, um, there's a figure in the early 20th century named um, Marcel Duchamp, who, um, who proposed that, um, who, who, who came up with the ready-made, that basically, that as artist, he could, um, he was famous in 1914 or 19, I think it was, for putting a urinal, signing a urinal and putting it in an art show. Um, of, mm -hmm. It was an early Dada art show. Mm -hmm. And his, his theory of the ready-made, he, he had a whole theory about, do it, about being post-retinal, that art to the Impressionist era and so on was a, was a display of uh, something for the eye. And that he basically invented conceptual art. And for him, the art was both, it was a transaction of him as artist defining the world, defining something like a urinal in the art show as like, that it, he didn't make the urinal, he bought the urinal, it came to him. He, he did things like his art was like a bicycle wheel. And it was uh, his first ready-made, I think was a uh, bottle rack. And, um, and so, but it basically is putting the artist, what, it, what it's done for me and in my reflections, you know, I, 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 I mentioned DIY culture. What it's done for me is to position, to recognize that everyone has artistic and creative ability. Everyone has music. Music is a, um, it's, it's not the commodity that's, that's sold. It's the um, it's the pattern of attention and reflection, and it's it's sort of an aesthetic lens of receiving the world. It's the audience that makes the music by receiving the work as music. Um, I mean, yes, the artist is there producing the music as well, but there's there's a you know when we talk about what is music in society, it's the it's that transaction. And so, you know, when in my own work in the 80s, for example, I got into field recordings, which was basically that my theory that I could take a, a microphone around the world and find musical situations in nature. And it was my identification of music in its organic form that was, you know, that's what made music music was, was the bracketing and the assignment of music feeling or whatever you know, whatever conceptual category that is of musicness, assigning it to a specific context and region. Um, so this is all to say, for example, when the other thing I think of when I, when I, when I think of uh, your issue about scarcity and so forth, is to go back, what is the music business? The origin of the music business is the piano roll, because the piano roll was the automated machine in the parlor 
that now someone didn't have to actually sit at the piano. And why was that even interesting? Because every family who aspired to have a piano, that everyone played music for their own entertainment. Um, so when we talk about what is music, um, we are actually dealing, if, if, we, if we talk about it in its commodity form, within its, its contextual logic of, of commodities and capitalism, we have to begin with Scott Joplin. Scott Joplin was uh, the, the, he was the Kurt Cobain of the piano role. He, he had a less tragic history, but he's, by, by creating ragtime and putting it on the piano, you start to get a performance that couldn't necessarily be copied by uncle or daughter or whomever might sit at the piano that night. And they sold millions. And so you had a context where almost everyone, every family could play and perform music. This is before radio. Um, where people start to gather around and enjoy entertainment in the evening instead of being performative as spectators. Um, so anyway, this is all just to say that when we think about these forums and we think about the, con the social context in which social preoccupations like music occur, um, we, we, we need to be thoughtful that about, about what, what comes first. And I, you know, and I think, I think really we're in a time of revolution where we as human beings, as, as organic, fatal, mortal beings, are contending with our, what, what's on the formal side, what's, what's, what, 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 what comes of abstraction, what comes of the game of capitalism or, uh, or, or, or the game of mathematics, which you play so well, uh, uh, Greg. And, um, and so it's really about getting the proper balance. Do we, do we, is our life to serve an algorithm or do we aspire to an organic vision of life and, and employ algorithms and contexts and, and capitalism and cooperatives and these other formal structures in order to serve, um, you know, healthy, um, healthy organic being, which includes music. It must, it's as ubiquitous as water. That's my position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's funny as, as you were, Speaking, uh, the of course the the t two other uh, things leapt to mind. Uh, one, of course, is uh, a stranger in a strange land, and and uh, you know mm -hmm. Michael Valentine Smith's uh, um, Water Brother. <laughs> um, and uh, and I the, will, uh, go ahead. Forgive me. I've never. I I somehow never read that book, and I will go to read the book. Uh, oh my God! It's I, it's. It is absolutely a work of genius. I mean, it's very much of its time, yeah. Uh, but it's still a work of genius. It's a, it's, you know, it's, you know, there's there's so many science fiction pieces that are like that, where they, you know, they they, they appear to be pulp fiction, but but it's really genius disguised in pulp fiction. Oh, of course. But, uh, but the, the, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt your flow. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. The other uh, the other thing, uh, you know, R Robert Fripp. Uh, sa says music is the cup. Mm. Music is music is the cup that holds the wine of silence, mm. and noise is the cup but broken, and mm. uh, sound is the cup but empty. Hmm. Hmm. I'll reflect on that. Those good good lyrics. <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting. You should hear Robert tell. Tell um, the story of how that happened. Uh, you know, apparently, a French uh, reporter asked him, "Well, what is music?" And Robert heard himself reply. He didn't. He didn't like you know formulate the reply, you know, in the forebrain, and then you know his his mouth followed his brain. It was rather the some, something arose in him, and he just heard himself say. The music is the cup that holds the wine of silence, um, and that that has always struck me as as very resonant. Um, but I, I think I think we're 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 sort of trying to get at the same thing. The 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 the, the thing that I have problems with is I don't know how to legitimately connect. Um, uh, remuneration and payment 
to the act of music. I mean, we have all these we have all these models, but you know, the 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 truth of it, and I think the reason why we're all here is that we've all felt something like in one flash, my whole life has changed. So, so, you know, someone play, someone sings a, a song, plays a, plays a melody, or there's some harmonic transition, and the whole world and, and my life has changed. And how do you, how do you put a value on that? How do you, how do you, I mean, it just, it, it feels, it feels unreasonable in, in many respects. You know, and I think what, what I would look for is some kind of regenerative structure in which we can continue to refresh and renew um, the artist and audience that support each other. Um, yes. And, you know, you know that, so that's, that's what I struggle with all the time. And I struggle with it in this larger context of I know that music plays this role in helping us wake up to the fact that the planet is melting and we need to take care of it um but i don't personally yet understand how to fit all the pieces together how what what role does music play in that in that um struggle uh and that you know that waking up and you know how does it support you know the actions that we're going to have to take and how does it support us taking them consciously and deliberately as opposed to having them extracted from us by force um, because of uh, calamity <clears throat> uh, so those are those are those are things that I, I struggle with on a regular basis and I, but I'm, I'm really open to hear what other people have to say well I, I talk about this maybe too much but I think that it's connected to demographic um, and like all great times <coughs> in history it's it's many un, seemingly unrelated things that all kind of intersect and I think we're on the cusp of that so I think that our role is to be prepared for it when it comes by by having the tools necessary um, because we're about to witness a, um, a, a a point in time when music becomes uh, a vehicle for a cause again um, and and we saw it happen in the late 60s. We saw it happen with punk rock. We saw it happen with grunge. And it was always connected to when a particular generation reached that pinnacle majority age of 18 to 25. And the Generation Z uh, generation is, 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 is hitting that right now. So we're going to see a collision of political upheaval, economic upheaval in the United States. We're going to see global warming unquestionably, even to the Donald Trump of real itself. We're going to see all of these urgent, urgent occurrences happening in the next like five years. And we're going to see uh, a, a generation that will um, require music to be its catalyst, like it did in the 60s, in the 70s, and the 90s. Um, and so, I think that uh, our job is to make the tools for them to coordinate, for us to all coordinate. Um, so this is why I'm so focused on the social aspect of what our song should be representing. And I don't think we need to worry about it down the road. I think we need to be building it now. Hey, Nora, are you there? I'm here, yes. What, I, 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 I feel like I've spoken too much in this session and I would love to invite you to reflect on whatever's on your mind. I don't think you've spoken too much. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I have a bit of a cold, so I'm a little congested here. But, um, well, uh, we have been talking a lot about a lot of esoteric concepts. I guess they're not that esoteric. Um, what do I think? Well, um, actually, there was something I wanted to bring up that happened recently. Um, I am a part of a group called Postmodern Jukebox, which is a YouTube band that is very famous 
now. Totally genius, very genius work, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, it has a, as a revolving cast, it's not like a band in the traditional sense. There's some core members and then there's a lot of special guests and I've, I've been a special guest on the road and also on the panel and there's a new video coming out soon. Anyway, they've got over a billion views with a B and um, Twitter just banned the leader of the band, Scott Bradley, who's a friend of mine. Um, because he did a cover, which is what the whole band's premise is what they do. They do covers of songs in like a ragtime jazz sort of 1920s style. Mm. Anyway, Twitter banned him. Also, my best friend from high school, Casey Abrams, who's also in this band. Um, he's an American Idol finalist and also mm. somebody with a big platform. Twitter suddenly banned these two people for doing these tiny little snippets of covers from several years ago, um, from my understanding, without any warning. And I just feel like that is really bizarre and unfair. And they bring so much joy to the platform and the world. And they bring a lot of value and a lot of customers to Twitter. And I just think it's a really, really bizarre situation that we're in this just happened a couple of days ago and i was talking to scott about it recently and there's this hashtag going hashtag free scott bradley and naturally all the fans are really upset because they're launching this huge las vegas residency this week and you know all this stuff is going on and i've got a video with scott coming out this or next week and it's just very upsetting to find out that you know you do something that people love um these shows are sold out, you know, all over the world. These, you know, videos, you know, often get millions and millions of views. Um, and then to find out, you know, like you can get banned um, because you brought some joy into the world. <laughs> I just think it's so weird. Um, and he was in this interview recently. I guess it might have been right before this happened. But anyway, somebody said, you know, is there an issue with doing covers? And do you feel like, you know, there's any issue with copyrights or anything? He said, no, you just register it with Harry Fox and everything is okay. But I guess Twitter had an issue with, you know, Universal or one of the major record companies and they weren't able to, you know, create an agreement. And so anyway, wow. that's something that's been on my mind. It's really upsetting me. So they didn't just um, pull the tweets. They, they closed his account. Oh yeah, I mean they deleted the entire. Th I don't know if it's deleted forever. I assume he's no. is just banned and they've, you know, put him in Twitter jail or something. But they didn't close his account, did they? I thought they just removed that one particular infringement. No, I mean he doesn't even have an account. Oh really? Yeah, and Casey Abrams doesn't have an account either. Like if you type them in, they don't exist on Twitter anymore. Well, that yeah, that's interesting because that's an, yeah. another. Like, that's why it's so crazy is like on Instagram, you know, because Instagram is another place. It's really weird if you post like, you know, I post videos of my dance classes or whatever. Like a lot of dancers do that. So you post the video, it's a little clip, you've got the music in there. And like, you know, they get really upset. They send you a whole email. They say this might not be available in these countries, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I guess Instagram has maybe done some kind of deals with some different um, labels and licensing to make sure that like people are able to share a certain music. but that's also very complicated I think it's obscene that like people are just trying to share like 30 second clips of like different things and that like you know on Instagram like you might not be able to share a video or you can put the video up but the music is silent that's usually what Instagram will do if it doesn't work but on Twitter they just full-on banned like the most popular music youtuber like this person who figured out how to like employ hundreds of musicians who like literally went viral on live YouTube music videos, which is so crazy. I just think it's just so wrong. So I tweeted at them and I was like, you have to undo this. Like, like, you know, he would like take down the videos if you asked him to, you know? Um, anyway, I just think it's really bizarre that, corporations have this kind of control. So I told yeah. Daryl about it and Daryl emailed me a very interesting response. And I sent your response, Daryl, back to Scott and Scott said, thank you so much. Okay. Um, he felt very supported by that. So anyway, that's been on my mind. Huh. That's, a, that's a really interesting one. You know, it reminds me of an observation I made 
uh, back in the mid 80s, early 90s. Um, there was a lot of work uh, in primate research on um, uh, uh, you know, teaching sign language and other kinds of symbolic systems to some of the other uh, great, you know, the, the other uh, primates. Um, uh, you know, so I'm sure people know about Coco, um, uh, who learned ASL, and they probably heard about Nim Chimsky and some of the other experiments. But there was one where instead of teaching the, uh, the primate um, sign language, right? It's like, you, like once you've taught Coco sign language, you can't take it away. Right? She, she has sign language, it's, it's a part of her skill set and it's, you know, you, you, you can't take that skill away from her. But there was one, uh, uh, I think it was a chimpanzee, where they, they used a, a symbol system with magnets and a, a, a magnetized whiteboard. And so she learned to communicate through this um, magnetized uh, whiteboard. But at the end of the experiments, they would take it away. Mm. So she didn't have her platform anymore. Mm. And I, I, thought, I thought a lot about that and the kind of impact that that would have on, you know, you know, any, any communicative being to take away the platform. And in, in, some, in some ways, that's sort of what's, what's going on here. To me, there's a strong analogy, you know, you, you take away the platform. And um, I, uh, I, I think that uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the best thing that we can do or I would hope is is to provide some kind of some kind of solution that's more uh, analogous to having the skill set to sign or the skill set to speak, um, right? If that can be the way in which the platform is delivered, rather than because it, because yeah. as soon as you have to as soon as you have to rely on this big technical monstrosity, right? Well, then unless somehow you're an owner of that thing or a participant of that thing and you have a say, then, you know, people will assert their right to take away uh, access to the platform. And so that's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting, difficult, tricky area, right? I mean, as an example, you know, suppose that um, someone who really had very bad intent and was quite um, skilled and manipulative of these kinds of larger communication platforms took it over um, in a way, would, would the community have the right to defend itself against uh, an attacker like that? Um, right. And so if you, if you admit that you need the ability to protect the platform from certain kinds of communications, then that very same ability can be applied in situations that not everyone agrees with. Now, I mean, I think it's, it's, it seems like they, they really mistreated Scott in this case. Yeah, um, well, yeah, the thing that really, well, you can finish your point. No, I just, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying that this is a, it's, it's, a, it's a really tricky area where I don't yeah. know, I don't know how, but I, 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 would, I would like to find a way to deliver a skill set that yeah. b belongs to the, 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 the person rather than, you know, a, a, a magnetized whiteboard and some magnetized symbols that could be mm -hmm. taken away. Yeah, I just think like it's just like, the really insulting part about me is not like that people should be allowed to like, you know, infringe on copyright or whatever. Like, I'm not advocating for that. I just think like, firstly, like, you know, all the artists that Scott does covers of, like a lot of them like call him up and ask him to like go on tour with the band. And like, they're such big fans. I think that the song he got in trouble for was like a, some kind of an Elton John cover or something. It was from like several years ago because like Twitter has been going through all this stuff. But like Scott has been doing everything exactly how you're supposed to do it. He pays mechanicals to everybody that he does covers from. So he does everything by the book. It's not like he's just, you know, running around doing some ratchet job. And I just think it's so self-defeating and like embarrassing that Twitter, watch now my account's getting get banned. Um, I just think it's so embarrassing that Twitter would do this to somebody in the music 
country because like they a lot of people get banned that are ridiculous but like he's doing exactly what you're supposed to do like you bring people together you offer something of value you like do it you know in a way that is like respectful you like if the reason that this happened is because twitter was not able to reach an agreement with whoever like the publishers or like whoever is in control of the rights of that song you know whatever that you know, whatever is the crux of that disagreement. That is the reason. It's not that Scott was behaving in a bad way. It's not that people don't like the music. It's not that this does not bring value to Twitter. Like, Twitter is shooting themselves in the foot with this. He had a huge audience there. And there are, like, a lot of people who are very upset with Twitter. I'm telling all of you about it. Like, this is bad PR for them. Like, this is stupid. And I just think it's so stupid that we have corporations that act like this when, like, this is their fault. Like if they don't want, you know, these covers going up without permission, then they should work out these deals. They shouldn't be like screwing themselves over and depriving the world of the kind of like happiness that we so desperately need. Like people are dying to hear somebody play freaking piano just to survive the coming apocalypse. You know, like we need that. You know, people need that. You know, so that's basically what just makes me so upset about it. You know, I know it's like not a big deal. It's just some guy with Twitter. But like, to me, it's a bigger symbolic thing than that. So, mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, if I understand the situation right, um, the, 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 the issue that you have stems from, as I'm 1998 Digital Millennium Copyright Act that um, allows for, I mean, Twitter came around well after the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, and all Twitter is doing is responding to the law. And, and the law basically states that the onus is on the infringee. So in this case, um, Scott played an Elton John song and that Elton John song is the property of Universal Publishing. So the onus, according to the law, is that Universal Publishing has to notify Twitter and issue a takedown notice and then Twitter has to respond. So, so, so the, I think the, the entity that you should be angry at is actually Universal Publishing. But I think also too, if you parse it even further back, what we should be angry about is, is a very, very poorly constructed law, or at least a law that maybe made sense back then to a certain degree, but needs massive revision, which is- Right, why, right. Because, because I- Universal I, I, doesn't have the ability to take down somebody's entire account though. Yeah, so that's the part that gets really weird because like- Right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, because either there was so many other examples of, of infringing like a lot of covers in his account that they just decided, let's just wipe the whole thing. But something happened where Twitter, of course, Twitter doesn't want to do that, right? Because, you know, they're-, they're in theory, just a platform that. Well, yeah, and this is why this is why our music, this is why our music business is so broken right now. Is like you have to think if you're a musician and you're doing indie music, you have to think about where you can post this stuff. Oh, can I post it on Instagram or not? Oh, can I post it on YouTube or not? Like you have to think about like which which like platforms are okay to post what stuff, you know. And yeah. that's, that's so cumbersome. It's exhausting. Like, it doesn't make any sense. We should not have to, like, you know, this, this is just ridiculous. Now, know? there is a solution that we could provide. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we could pay out to the publishers better than anybody else. And then the problem goes away. So. Well, also, I, is it so that what's being tweeted is um, our videos? Is it like, Is it a, like link a link to a, video? to a video? Yeah, they're like little cover videos. They're like little clips. They're not even- Because that's, that, that's the other confusion and issue here is because that's well, a different kind of license. That's the also, synchronized video. They're also where, done in his own style. They're not like yeah. playing covers. They're very stylized in his right. own. No, and see, but that's what I'm, what all I was going to say is that it's, it's a kind of an arbitrariness of the law because for many years, like you can do a cover song, you can record a cover song without permission and the previous copyright law provided for that. You can, you could make records of it. You just, there was a rate, you paid the mechanical rate to the publisher. But when 
uh, when the new form came uh, where you have to synchronize to video that fall that 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 different form falls outside the old convention um, so so that's why it's the it's the video synchronization license is 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 different than what the old compulsory composition license used to be that was embedded there are, there are laws in that haven't caught up to video yet yeah and it also falls outside of the purview of the mma oh MMA Jesus. Is strictly for interactive streaming music streaming services. is it too early for a cocktail i just can't even it's never too early for a cocktail i just can't even it's 9 a.m here that's not even possible i just can't even take it <laughs> This is so. Ugh. Yeah, it's I mean, just yet another example of of how there really does need to be an alternative. Um, you yeah. know, it, the world is calling out for it, and you know, like, it's just uh, it, it gets frustrating for me because it's just you know, watching these different uh, attempts spin their wheels. It's just uh, I don't know. I wish that um, we were more ahead of the game where we, than where we are right now. If we've got a few more min minutes of reflection, I, I was going to take, um, I was going to kind of key back into something that Greg was saying about, because I think a lot of these issues, like what you bring, Nora, um, they are, it's, they're administrative issues. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep holding on to my music is water analogy. Um, but they're, but they're about the formality and the administration and the arbitrariness of administration, the, the lack of, I mean, that you're always going to have a gap between a formal structure and, you know, an idealized formal structure and its organic realization um, as earthly matter, if you will. And so one of, but one of the, so I, again, one of the reasons that I, you know, I, I found myself preoccupied with our chain was this concept of smart money, you know, and, 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 and a basis of transactions. So that if my money was just with my community or what is money, but signal of a resource transaction. And this, this comes, this is, this matters in music because I really believe like what I see as the reason, the reason we listen to musicians, there's, we have to parse the, creative spirit of a, of a live musician in performance or, or a, a, lyr, a, lyr, a songwriter in response to the world and the kind of creativity that comes from that kind of moment of creation. We have to parse that from the recorded document and its, its set of transactions. And so the one is, might be called talent and the other might be called music maybe or, or the music uh, recording business or, or music distribution or some other category of things. Um, but the reason that we pay attention to artists is because we share their context in the stream of, of social time and they play. Musicians play. They, they are playing live. Either you go to a concert and you're either you're, you're, dis you're discovering as they reveal a context line of music that they may uh, have composed in such a way as to refer to it in different ways and we watch the way they do that or there are performers that just we go to see you know on this date on you know April uh, 26 2019 um, we show up to see what this artist has to to respond to the world with and we we share their response and um, and so that's again why when I when I think of what is the upstream what is the source of value? Um, well, two things are this. One, you find if you can recognize talent, if you can recognize the playful spirit that, that can communicate context and respond to it, that's what talent is. And that's like you get talented people and interesting things will happen. Um, the other is, is that if we want to kind of look outside this context of capitalism, if you will, like there are so many artists that are made that have this spark of response to their context that they don't care like just give them the basic tools give them water give them transportation give them a house give them food let them have a dignified life and the music 
their, their capacity to respond in interesting ways to the context that we share globally will just happen. It, that's what I mean by it being water, being organic. That, like, and what, 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 what Daryl was referring to earlier about you know, um, that demographic of the 18 to 25s, that's just the nature of like, how long it takes for an image, for sort of the, the aesthetic qualities of, of the media um, to kind of transition so that you can tell current from old. And once you, once you have that context on your global media sphere, um, then you and your friends of a certain age have that kind of ironical response to what everybody else thinks is still live. We get to a liveness argument. <laughs> um, anyway, what, what you can, like the young ones can tell um, the old culture from live culture because they're living it, where the old ones look at the old culture and think it's still live. And that, that's what we call, that's, that's where now the young ones get to create new context at play with the media sphere and the social world. And you can recognize the talented ones in that context. So anyway, this, this is, um, I guess to bring it back to a specific trigger out of what Greg was saying, um, where you were saying, what are, what, how do we, create the system, you know, to use the Marxian term, it's reproduction. What, is, what are the institutions of reproduction for, for us as human beings? You know, how do we, our, our, our domestic sphere, our, 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 you know, how do we educate ourselves? How do we make ourselves productive um, participants in society? That, that's, our, that's our mode of reproduction. And- um, that's, that's where we'll have to leave it. Because- Okay, uh, all right. Most it's 9.30. To to it's yes, 9 .30. all right. Good questions, good conversation. Looking forward to seeing you guys next week. Thank you, week. Rich. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Nora. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Daryl. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all.